When I was in college and Laura and I were dating, we watched a movie, maybe you've seen it, and there's a lot of movies that deal with the end times. It's called A Thief in the Night. Did anybody ever see this movie? It was made in the 70s. Well, I think all of you would agree it was the most cheesiest movie that was ever made. The acting was terrible. In fact, Christian movies have improved significantly over the years, but this particular one was very, very cheesy, and it talked about the rapture, but it also talked about the coming tribulation period, which is going to take place on this earth, and that's what I want to talk about this evening, is the coming tribulation to this earth in Daniel chapter 12. We are winding down the book of Daniel. This is the final chapter, and this last chapter, Daniel is going to be dealing with the tribulation that is going to be hitting the earth. Now, even non-believers know that we are headed in a wrong direction in our country, and if you bring up this grand tribulation that is coming, many of them will probably shake in their boots, and they probably wouldn't deny it, although there are scoffers out there that would deny it. Now, remember, the purpose of Daniel is to show us how Gentile nations dominated Israel because of their sin. So, for example, in the book of Daniel, here are the Gentile nations that basically would dominate Israel. In the book of Daniel, Babylon and Persia were the two nations that are talked about in the book of Daniel. But Daniel also mentions Greece. He mentions Rome, and this would be historical Rome, Rome number one. And then he also mentions Rome number two, which is a revived Roman empire where the Antichrist is going to be the final kingdom that rules before Jesus Christ comes back. Now, Jesus described all of these Gentile nations ruling Israel as the times of the Gentiles. He mentions that in the Gospels. Now, what God does is He gives Daniel a series of visions and angelic visits to show him exactly how these different nations are going to control Israel. So if you look at the next slide, you will notice in chapter 2, God gave Daniel a vision of the different metals, and that indicated the different world empires that would dominate Israel. Then in chapter 7, he mentions four animals or four beasts. He reveals that to Daniel in a vision. And then, of course, in chapter 8, he shows Daniel various horns, and those horns represent different Gentile nations that will rule over Israel. Then when you get to chapter 9, he deals what is called infamously the 70th week of Daniel. That's a 490-year prophecy of what would happen to Israel. And then finally, and this is the last section that we're in right here, God sends an angel to Daniel in chapters 10 through 12, and he reveals to Daniel all the different kings that are going to rule over Israel. Now, let me show you a summation of chapter 11 and 12, because John dealt with chapter 11 last week. It's the most difficult chapter in Daniel and probably in the Bible. It's very difficult. But in chapter 11, here are the different kings that would rule over Israel. You had Darius to Xerxes. This would be four kings that represent the Persian Empire. Babylon is now gone. You have Darius all the way to Xerxes, four Persian kings in chapter 11 that is mentioned. Then you have, no, go back. Then you have Alexander the Great. He's over the Greek Empire. Following Persia, you have Greek. That's chapter 11. And then he also mentions in chapter 11 four generals that will take over for Alexander, okay? Now, if you go to the next slide, here of the four generals, here are the two that are predominant right here, Seleucus and Ptolemy. Lysimachus and Cassander, they're not really talked about much. They ruled in this area. But Seleucus of the Syrian Empire and Ptolemy of the Egyptian Empire, these two Greek kings and the kings that followed in their succession, they would constantly be battling for about 200 years, and guess who was caught in the middle of these battles? Israel. They were the ones that were caught in the middle. All right, next slide. So you go from Persia, chapter 11, to the Greek, Alexander. Alexander dies, his four generals, 
Two of them basically rule Israel, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. And then you have the Romans. The Romans are mentioned in Daniel chapter 9. It doesn't mention Rome, but Rome is there. And so following the Greek Empire, you have Rome. And then you're going to jump now to chapter 11 and 12. And this is the section we're going to look at tonight is the Antichrist during the seven-year tribulation. That's mentioned in chapter 12. You have all these kingdoms that ruled over Israel. Now, here's what's interesting. This is eliminated in the Bible. World history of oppression of the Jews. You jump from the Romans dominating the Jews during the time of Jesus, and then all of a sudden the book of Daniel launches into the Antichrist in the future and the seven-year tribulation period. That's talked about in 11, but primarily chapter 12. But notice what skipped, world history of oppression of the Jews. It's not mentioned in the Bible. But you and I know, and listen, I debated whether to put it up on the screen. I looked this up on the internet. There is a long list of how the Jews have been persecuted historically. We know the Holocaust as being one of the major ones or the seven-day war that happened in 1967. And today, Jews are still persecuted. Now, Jewish people live in their land in a modicum of peace, but the fact is they are surrounded by Muslim nations that want to wipe them off the planet. And so what we want to do tonight in chapter 12 is look at this last section. It jumps from the Romans oppressing Israel all the way to the future of the Antichrist, the seven-year tribulation. And that's what we want to talk about in chapter 12, the coming tribulation on the earth. And there are several components of the tribulation that I want to share with you this evening. First of all, I would have you note that during the tribulation, there will be suffering. There will be suffering. Notice chapter 12, verse 1. He says, and there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. Notice the emphasis here. It says during the tribulation, it is going to be a very distressful time unlike any other time in human history. If you read Jeremiah chapter 30, it is specifically called Jacob's trouble. Jacob is a term for Israel. There is a time of distress, a time of suffering that is coming upon this earth known as the tribulation. God will pour out his wrath on this earth for seven years. And Gentile nations as well as the Jewish people will suffer. Now remember, Israel will be protected during the first half of that tribulation period, and in the second half, they will suffer some more. Let me show you the chart here. You will notice you have this present church age, which we're in right now. We are waiting the rapture of the church. That's the next event on God's timetable. The rapture can happen at any moment. There are no events that must be fulfilled in order for the rapture to happen. The rapture is imminent. It could happen at any moment. And notice, once we're raptured, Shortly thereafter, the seven-year tribulation will start. The seven years is divided into two three-and-a-half-year periods. The first three-and-a-half years is called the beginning of sorrows. It is during this time that Israel is protected. The Antichrist will make a peace treaty with Israel during this first three-and-a-half years. And then, during the second three-and-a-half years, it's not called the beginning of sorrows. It's called the Great Tribulation. That's what Daniel is referring to here in verse 1, a time of distress. The whole time is a time of distress, but during this last three and a half years, all hell will break loose. Israel will not be protected because the Antichrist will break his covenant in the middle, and during the last three and a half years, Israel will be persecuted in a merciless way. Now, notice the next slide up on the screen. You will notice During the first three and a half years, Israel is protected by the Antichrist. Many people believe that the sealed judgments mentioned in Revelation chapter 6 are going to happen during that first three and a half years. And then the second three and a half years, you're going to have the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments. Now, as these progress, the seal, the trumpets, and the bowl judgments mentioned in Revelation, they're going to progressively get worse. That's why this last three and a half years is called the Great Tribulation. The bold judgments happen right at the end of the tribulation, and they happen in rapid-fire succession. Boom, 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 and then Jesus Christ comes back. 
And so, this is a time of distress during the tribulation. The first three and a half years, yes, there will be distress. But that last three and a half years, it is going to be a time of great, great suffering. In fact, Jesus said this in Matthew 24, verse 22, about that time. He says, and if those days had not been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, that's you and I, those days have been cut short. And listen, if there's coming a time of distress on this earth, you know what we need to be doing? We need to be out witnessing to people. Obviously, we're going to do it in our own way, but we got to take seriously the Great Commission. Why? Because God wants us to warn other people. Now, obviously, we warn them, but we also extend hope to them by giving them the gospel of Jesus Christ. But if this is where history is headed, we must be warning people because if we don't warn people, we are derelict in our duty. If you saw someone about to walk into a house that was about to collapse and you didn't warn them, you would be held liable. You would be derelict in your duty. Well, how many people are headed into eternal perdition, potentially the seven-year tribulation if they're not raptured out, and we don't warn them? You know, Laura and I went to go see the movie Elvis the other night. Now, some of you remember Elvis, some of you don't, some of you don't care. The movie was actually pretty good, and I remember as a kid growing up in Miami, I was 10 years old when Elvis died. All I remember was my mom crying, and I'm like, why is she crying? And she's like, Elvis is dead. I'm like, who's Elvis? I didn't know who he was, but it was all on television. I think it was 1977. I was born in 67. And so I was talking to my mom about the movie, and we were reminiscing me growing up, and it got into a discussion of politics, and then I got into the subject of the tribulation, and I told my mom, I said, Mom, you got to be warned. I said, make sure you know Jesus, because she said, well, I fear, son, for your grandchildren. I said, well, I do too. There's a concern for all of us about where things are going, but I said, all we can do is preach the gospel to our children, our grandchildren, and pray that they make the right decision. We got to stay on our knees. But you see, I was warning my mother. I believe my mom's a Christian, but I just want to make sure. And so it is with you and I. And so the tribulation is going to be, first of all, marked by great distress. There's a second thing we learn about the tribulation, and that is this, there will be a great deliverance during that time there will be a great deliverance. Notice, if you will, verse 1. Now at that time, what time? The time of the future, the tribulation, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, here it is, will be rescued. It will be a time of great deliverance. If you go back to chapter 11 of Daniel, verse 21, he says, yet there is no one who stands firmly with me against these forces except Michael, your prince. So in spite of the fact that there's going to be a great time of distress on this earth for seven years. There's going to be a lot of suffering among Jews and non-Jews. God is going to work on Israel's behalf, and there's going to be a great deliverance among the Jews and Gentiles, but primarily among the Jews, there is going to be a great deliverance. God is going to work on behalf of the Jewish people. And there's two ways that God is going to deliver his people Israel. First of all, he's going to deliver them physically. Remember, God is going to pour out his wrath during the seven-year tribulation. As I mentioned earlier, in the book of Revelation, it uses three images to describe how God is going to pour out his wrath upon the earth. He's going to use seal judgments. Every time a seal is broken from the scroll, a judgment is released on the earth. And then every time an angel blows his trumpet, a judgment is released upon the earth. And then finally, there are these saucers or these bowls mentioned in Revelation 16. They're going to be dumped on the earth. These are metaphors to basically say God is going to pour out his wrath upon this earth. And then in addition to God's wrath, you have the wrath of Satan. In Revelation chapter 12, Satan is going to be thrust out of heaven, it says. And he knows that his time is short. 
And so during the tribulation period, Lucifer is literally going to go after the Jewish people and he's going to try to annihilate them. Why? Because they are God's people. In fact, if you read Revelation chapter 12, he tells the story when Lucifer falls, he basically says that uh, Satan is going to work through the Antichrist. You can't see the picture here, but this is a seven-headed beast with seven heads and ten horns, and it talks about water being spewed out of its mouth, trying to swallow Israel. And obviously, that's imagery to say that Satan is going to work through the Antichrist to try to snuff out Israel. But here's the deal. There is going to be a great deliverance physically. God is going to preserve a number of Jews. We know from Revelation 7, it's going to be 144,000 Jews, and there's probably going to be other Jews as well that God is going to preserve physically so they enter into the millennial kingdom physically. And you know who's going to be the great protector of Israel physically during the time of the tribulation? It is going to be Michael. Michael, according to Daniel chapter 11 and chapter 12, he mentions, is the great deliverer or defender of Israel. In fact, when I grew up, I went to the Greek Orthodox Church or the Syrian Orthodox Church, and I remember, I wasn't born again at the time, but if you go into one of those churches, whether it's Greek or Syrian, it's very beautiful. They have a lot of murals on the wall and a lot of paintings. It's, it's very beautiful, and it can induce worship to a certain degree. But I remember, go to the next slide, you will, I remember seeing this mural on the wall inside the church where it had a picture of Michael the archangel, and he was taking a spear, and he was thrusting it through the dragon's mouth. At the time, I didn't understand the significance of that, but that is what the Bible says. God is going to use Michael who is an angel, to help protect Israel. And by the way, the good news is the Bible says that God uses angels today to protect you and I. Now, I think we'll be surprised when we get to heaven to maybe see all of the events that God may have protected us from using angelic beings. I've never encountered an angel, but that's not to say that God hasn't protected me through an angel. Listen to what Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14 says about angels. Are they not all ministering spirits? sent out to provide service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation, that's their role, is to protect. Now, obviously, if God doesn't want to protect you, he's going to allow you to die because precious in his sight is the death of his saints. So sometimes it's not God's will to preserve us physically, but Michael is going to preserve Israel, a remnant. Now, there's going to be a number of Jews that die during that time, but there is going to be a remnant that he preserves. And listen, God preserves you. Now, the Bible says we're not to pray to angels. We're not to worship angels. But there's nothing wrong with crying out to God and asking God to send angels to protect us. I was reading a true story about two college roommates. And they were studying in the library. They had a group project. And um, they had to be back at their dorm by 11 o'clock that evening. Well, they lost track of time. And both girls were like, shoot, we're going to be late to the dorm. And one of the girls could not afford to be late again because she had been late too many times. She was going to get in trouble. So they threw all their stuff in their uh, backpacks. And the one girl decided that she was going to take a shortcut through the forest. Now, you have to understand, the girl that took the shortcut through the forest, she was a non-believer. She was an atheist. Her roommate was a born-again Christian and had been working on her for a number of months And her unbelieving roommate finally had gotten to a point where she began to agree that Jesus was who he claimed to be, and she was very close to becoming a Christian. So she takes off, and her friend says, no, don't go through the forest. It's dangerous. There's been a lot of sightings of uh, people in there. Uh, It's very dangerous. Don't go. But her friend said, I can't afford to be late. So she jetted off, and she went through the forest. Well, her friend went in the other direction but she felt guilty. And so she decided to go after her roommate and to be with her. And so she prayed a prayer and she said, God, protect me. And so she went through the forest crying out to her roommate's name to no avail, and she didn't hear any footsteps. And so she finally got to the dorm figuring her roommate made it to the dorm before her. Well, when she got in, she found out her roommate was not there. Well, come to find out, her roommate was murdered in the forest. There was a guy lurking in the forest. He murdered her, cut her throat, and he raped her. And so when she went to court and basically had to testify as to what happened, this is a true story, 
Here is what the roommate said. She wanted to speak to the killer that did this to her roommate, and here is what she said, and I quote, I had become very close to my friend, my roommate, my classmate. I still miss her very much. I'm very grieved by what you did to her. I will never get over it. You were very selfish to rape and kill my friend for your own pleasure. My friend was an atheist. She was close to making a decision to receive Christ as her Lord and Savior. She was not prepared to die. I am a Christian. I was prepared to die. She said, please answer me this one question. Why didn't you kill me? The killer said, quote, I was going to kill you and rape you too and still, until I saw that huge man walking with you. You were smart to have him by your side. End quote. Angels do protect God's own. Maybe not all the time, but they do. And so during this time, the tribulation is going to be a time of great suffering, but it's also going to be a time of great deliverance. God is going to protect Israel physically. Many will die of the Jewish nation, but he will have a remnant, particularly the 144,000 mentioned in Revelation chapter 7. However, there's also going to be a great deliverance spiritually. It's not just physically that God is going to deliver Israel, but he's going to deliver Israel spiritually. Many Jews today reject Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, but listen carefully. During the second half of the tribulation, especially when persecution becomes intense among the Jews, many Jews are going to finally embrace Jesus as their Messiah, and as Romans chapter 11 says, all Israel will be saved. Listen to what Zechariah prophesies in Zechariah 12.10, and by the way, we're going to be doing Zechariah after the book of Daniel. He says this in verse 10, and I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. This is going to happen during the tribulation, and notice what the Jews will do. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. Many Jews are going to see Jesus as their Messiah, and they're going to repent. Listen to what Zechariah 13, 1 says during that time, the second half of the tribulation, many Jews will be saved. On that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. Yes, God will deliver Israel physically, but even more important, he's going to deliver many of them spiritually. During the second half of the tribulation, many of them are going to embrace Jesus Christ as their Messiah, and many of them will come to saving faith. And as Romans 11 said, all Israel will be saved. And so what do we learn about the tribulation? It is a time of suffering. Secondly, it is a time of great deliverance. Thirdly, there will be a grand resurrection. There will be a grand resurrection during and after the tribulation period. Notice verse 2 of Daniel 12. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground, will awake. That's a physical resurrection. These to everlasting life. In other words, out of this resurrection, you're going to have some who are resurrected to everlasting life. They're going to go into the presence of God. These would be people that accepted God or accepted Jesus, depending on the dispensation you lived in. But those who were saved... They're going to enter into eternal life when they're resurrected, but others are going to go to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Those would be the ones that rejected God and Jesus, and they bore bad fruit. They will be resurrected into eternal damnation. Jesus talked about this in John chapter 5. He says, do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear the voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. Now, you have to understand that death is a separation of the soul from the body. That's what happens when you die. By the way, God never intended your soul to separate from your body. It is a curse. It is the consequence of what Adam and Eve did. We all inherit death. God's intention was never that your soul and your body would separate, but that's the penalty for sin. And so the moment you die, your soul is going to exit your body and it will separate and your soul will go into the presence of God or it will go into eternal damnation. 
In fact, my neighbor in New Jersey, I was talking to him one day. I, I had opportunity to witness to him and his wife. And I don't know if he came to Saving Faith. He died years ago. But he told me, he said, Mike, I remember, and I can't remember who it was. He was a friend. He was in the military. He was an older gentleman. It was either his friend or his sister. He says, Mike, I am not lying. He says, and I didn't see. He says, what I saw wasn't fake. He said, the moment my sister died, he said, I saw something leave her body. And he said, I wasn't hallucinating. Something left her body. It was like, poof, it went up, he said. And it stunned him. That's what's going to happen at death. The soul will separate from the body. But here's what Daniel is saying. There's going to be a grand resurrection when God is going to raise everyone's body. And what's going to happen is their soul in heaven or hell is going to be reunited to their body to suit their environment. You see, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. God has to give you a new resurrected body to join with your soul so that you can live in heaven because your human body and my human body cannot coexist with God in heaven. Neither can a person who goes to hell. They have to have a special resurrected body to help them survive in that dimension. Now, there's going to be a resurrection. Now, the Bible, and you have to piece this together. I want you to follow with me on this. I'm going to show you some charts. Resurrections are going to happen at different times as you piece the Bible together. Look at the screen up here. Now, Revelation 20 talks about the first resurrection, and then there's a second resurrection. The first resurrection happens in different phases. First, there is Christ's resurrection. He's the first fruits, the Bible says. He's part of this first resurrection. Then there's raptured believers. We're waiting that to happen right now. And then at the end of the tribulation, all the people that survived or died, I should say, during the tribulation or if they're still alive, they're going to be resurrected, resurrected. And then finally, all Old Testament believers are going to be resurrected at the end of the tribulation. So the first resurrection mentioned in Revelation 20, here are the different phases of when it's going to happen. All right, here's another way of looking at it. You have Christ's resurrection right here. Then we're in this present age right now. And then the church is going to be raptured right here. That's part of our resurrection. And then at the end of the tribulation, when Jesus comes back, Martyrs who die during the tribulation, they're going to be resurrected. Old Testament saints are going to be resurrected as well. You say, what about people who survive during the tribulation? They're going to enter the kingdom in their physical bodies. Now go back to the last side, Matt. I want you to notice the second resurrection. This is for all non-believers. That happens at the end of the thousand-year millennial kingdom. So the first resurrection happens before the thousand years. The second resurrection happens at the end of the thousand years. This is all non-believers of all time from the beginning of Adam. No Christians will be in this one. Capiche? Go to the next slide. You see it right here. Right at the end of the thousand-year kingdom, all non-believers will be resurrected. You say, well, Daniel doesn't say that. Daniel is just giving us in chapter 12 a general resurrection. But if you piece together the New Testament, there are different timings as to when people are going to be resurrected. And so this is going to happen. And what does the Bible say that you and I need to be doing? If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul details the resurrection in that chapter, and here's how he summarizes the chapter, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. He says, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Why? Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. If there is coming a general resurrection, you're going to be given a new model, a new body. Your soul and your body are going to be reunited together. Paul says, in light of that, what should you be doing right now? What should I be doing? Not being distracted by the world. We ought to be focused on doing the work of God, living for God, honoring God, serving God. Our passion and our hope should be to get the gospel out. Well, there's a fourth component of 
the seven-year tribulation on earth, and that is this, there will be awesome rewards. There will be awesome rewards. Notice, if you will, verse 3 of Daniel 12. And those who have insight, now, who are those who have insight? That would refer to those who are wise or those who impart wisdom to others. Those who have insight or are wise or impart wisdom to others, notice their reward. They will shine like the glow of the expanse of heaven, and those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. In fact, he says this to Daniel in verse 13 of chapter 12. He makes a personal promise to Daniel. He says, Daniel, but as for you, go your way to the end. Then you will rest, you will die, and rise for your allotted portion. That would be reward at the end of the age. Daniel, I'm not going to give you any more information. Go about your business. You're going to eventually die. God's going to raise you, and then you are going to be rewarded. And so what we see here is that following the tribulation, following the millennial kingdom into the eternal state, Daniel is basically saying that there is going to be great reward for those who impart wisdom to others and those who live for the Lord. Now, imparting wisdom to others is basically saying that you're living the Christian life, you're sharing your faith with others, you're serving God out of the gifts that He's given you, you are faithful to the Lord. That's going to look different for all of us. And so if you're faithful to the Lord, doing what the Lord has called you to do, and you're fulfilling your assignment, you know what this passage promises? At the end of the millennial, you're going to be rewarded. And he says, you're going to shine like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. In other words, you're going to shine like the stars. What is that referring to? Well, it's basically saying that you're going to be given a glorified body. Now watch this. I believe part of our reward in heaven is we're going to have different capacities to glorify God. What does that look like? I don't know, but some are going to shine brighter than others. Why? Because your glorified body is going to reflect God's glory. You're going to be a GE light bulb. And some people, the brightness of their bodies is going to be greater than others. They're going to have greater forms of service in heaven based on their faithfulness now. If you ever watch National Geographic, you ever seen one of those shows where they go down into the trenches of the ocean, I'm talking 10,000 feet below the surface of the ocean, and they find all these bizarre creatures. You ever seen these creatures that light up like a GE light bulb? You ever see some of them before on the bottom of the ocean? Look at the next one here. Then you got these, and God's created all kinds. And then, of course, this last one right here. Look at that one right there. It has within it this illuminescence where it's able to shine. Listen, the Bible says that's going to be part of your reward. You're going to serve God in heaven. And so it does matter whether or not you're faithful to God now. Yes, if you're a Christian, you're getting in. And I've had Christians say to me, look, I don't care about really being faithful as long as I get into heaven. I've had people tell me that. All I want to do is get in. And listen, if you trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior and produce enough fruit, you will get into heaven, but some Christians are going to be rewarded more than others. In fact, there's an aphorism that says this, what you weave in time, you will wear in eternity. What you weave in time, you will wear in eternity. And so here's the question, are you living for eternal rewards or are you living for the here and now? It reminded me of the preacher that died and went to heaven, and when he got up there, he noticed that there was a New York taxi driver that had been given more rewards than him. And so he said to Peter, he said, I don't understand. He says, I was faithful to my congregation all these years. Why is this New York taxi driver getting more rewards? He said, listen, when you preached, people slept. He said, when the New York taxi drivers drove, he said, the people not only stayed awake, but they prayed. And so there is reward, and we need to be faithful to do what God has called us to do. Well, there's a fifth component of the tribulation period, and that is this. There will be a pursuit of greater understanding of prophecy. During the end times, when all of this is unfolding, people are going to be pursuing a greater understanding of prophecy. Look at verse 4 of Daniel 12. But as for you, Daniel, keep these words secret. And seal up the book 
until the end of time. He says, many will roam about and knowledge will increase. And in verse 8, but as for me, Daniel says, I heard but did not understand. So he was hearing all this but didn't get the understanding. So I said, my Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for these words will be kept secret and sealed up until the end of time. In other words, he, Daniel wanted to know a greater understanding of these events and what they meant. And the angel basically says to Daniel, go your way, Daniel. The meaning is not clear to you, but it's going to be clear to others during that time period. Now, you got to understand that prophets in the Old Testament, when God gave them prophecies about the first coming of Jesus or the second coming of Jesus with all the events associated with the second coming, many of them saw in a mirror dimly. They didn't understand. First Peter chapter 1 says they studied their own prophecies to try to figure out the meaning of it, but it was veiled to them. And to a certain degree, it is veiled to us. They were pre-cross. We are post-cross. We look back at Daniel, and we have a greater understanding. We look back at the book of Revelation, we have a greater understanding. But make no mistake about it, we don't understand all the details. We don't understand all the variables. And so we struggle to comprehend. And what the angel told Daniel is the meaning of what I'm revealing to you will become more clearer to people living during that time. As the events draw near, people will be pursuing prophetic knowledge and they will be studying Daniel in greater detail. They'll be studying the book of Revelation in greater detail. They'll be studying the book of Zechariah in greater detail. They'll be given a better understanding as the events unfold. It's kind of like a child. You know, I remember growing up, my parents would say, do this because I said so. I don't understand. You remember that? You get mad at your parents because maybe what they would tell you, you couldn't quite understand. Jesus said to his disciples, I have many things to tell you, but you're not able to comprehend them at this point. It's just like us. Our parents told us things that we didn't quite understand, but now that we're adults, we have our own children, we look back and we say, you know what, now I know what mom and dad meant. We didn't have the understanding. And that's what he's saying here. During that time, even though Daniel didn't quite understand it, the book was sealed, it was somewhat veiled to Daniel. He says, Daniel, go your own way, don't worry about it. People during that day will be seeking after knowledge. They will be going to and fro seeking after knowledge. Now, let me bring up to you a controversial interpretive issue here, and that is this. If you go to the next slide, you will notice that he mentions many will roam about in verse 4. And what many people think is this is a prophecy that there will be an increase in the last days of people traveling. In other words, the ability to travel, cars and airplanes... They will say verse 4 is a prophecy about that. And then in verse 4, he says knowledge will increase. And so many people think that that's a prophecy about the technological boom that we have seen in our time period. Well, I respectfully disagree. This has nothing to do with modern day travel. It has nothing to do with techn technological advancements in knowledge. All he's saying is people are going to be going to and fro seeking knowledge as to what the meaning of Daniel means and what the meaning of the book of Revelation means. And Revelation wasn't even written at this juncture. It's not talking about information or travel. It's just simply saying that during that time as the tribulation is unfolding, people are going to be what? Going to and fro seeking out knowledge. They're wanting to know why is this happening? What's going on? And so, Daniel is saying that there is going to be an increase in prophetic knowledge. Now listen, just because we don't have all the facts doesn't mean we should stop studying. We all need to be diligent. And you know why I think God kept some of it nebulous? We do have some of the major themes, but some of the specifics, the reason why God didn't give us the details, 
because it would create more complacency. We already struggle with complacency, but the reason why God kept it only general is because it forces us to dig, it forces us to study, and there is benefit in having opposing views. You know why? Because iron sharpens iron. And so when Christians disagree over certain prophetic issues, obviously we want it to be friendly fire. But when we disagree, you know what it does? It forces us to dig even deeper. And so just because we don't understand everything doesn't mean we shouldn't study. Well, as we wind down, there's a sixth component of the tribulation, and that is this. There will be a specific timetable. Notice, if you will, verse 5. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others were standing, one on this bank of the stream and the other on that bank of the stream. Now, when Daniel was looking, here is what he saw. One angel was on this side of the Tigris River. You can't see the land here, but you get the idea. Here is the other angel standing on this side of the Tigris River, and you have this being floating above the water. Some think it could be Gabriel. Some think it could be Jesus, a pre-incarnate Christ. And so this is what Daniel is seeing, this being and two angels on the bank of the river. And someone, who's the someone? Well, probably one of those angels there on the bank said to the man dressed in linen, that would be the guy in the middle, who was above the waters of the stream, how long will it be until the end of these wonders? How long is this going to go? Listen, even they are curious about the timetable. How much more we as humans, aren't we obsessed with timetables? One of the angels there said, how long is this going to go on for? What's the timetable? And you know what? We have a human need for dates and timetables. Do you remember this guy up in the screen? Anybody know his name? Harold Camping. Do you remember him back in 2011? He was basically saying this on the next slide. He was saying Judgment Day was May 21st, 2011. Do you remember all those billboards? I remember them up in New Jersey. In fact, there was a guy that drove one of these Winnebago's in New Jersey. Everywhere he went, he had plastered all over his vehicle uh, all these days, this date of judgment. He had all this weird stuff. And I remember I crossed paths with him coming out of Walmart. And I said, hey, I said, what's up with the dates? And so him and I got in a discussion, and I was trying to explain to him why you can't set dates, but the guy would never let me get a word in edgewise. He would talk the whole time, and every time I tried to give my point of view, he'd say, the Bible says we're not to strive. We're not to strive against each other. I said, you're the one striving, not me. But listen, Harold Camping was totally wrong, and it blew out his credibility. And there have been many people historically that have tried to set dates. So the angel says, how long is this going to happen? Verse 7, and I heard the man dressed in linen. That would be the angel in the middle there, Gabriel, or possibly Christ, who was above the waters of the stream as he raised his right hand and his left towards heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, and here is the timetable. It will be a time, that's one year, times, that's two years, and a half a time, that's a half a year, and so when you add that up, what does it come to? Three and a half years or 1,260 days. And so look at the time right here. The angel lifts up his hands, and why is he lifting up his hands? That's swearing an oath. When he said, how long is this going to be? He says, let me tell you how long it's going to be, and I swear this on an oath. That's the raising of his hands. He says it's going to be 1,260 days or three and a half years. That would be the last half of the tribulation. That's when God is really going to pour out his wrath. But then the timetable gets more complicated. Watch this. Verse 11. He says, and from that time that the regular sacrifice is abolished. Now remember, the Jews during the first three and a half years, the Antichrist is going to protect them. The Antichrist is going to allow the Jewish people during the first three and a half years to offer up sacrifices in a rebuilt temple. But what's going to happen at the middle of the tribulation? He's going to stop the Jews from offering up sacrifices. He's going to demand that the world worship him, and he's going to destroy all world religions. He's going to become the one to be worshipped. So he says in verse 11, and from the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished, that is the midpoint of the tribulation where he stops the Jews 
and the abomination of desolation that is set up. The Antichrist is going to set up an image of himself according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He says in that time period, he says there will be 1,290 days. You say, wait a minute, stop there. Earlier, he said the last three and a half years is 1,260. Now, he's adding more, and he says it's 1,290. That's an extra 30 days. And then he gets even more mathematical in verse 12. Blessed is the one who is patient and attains to the 1,335 days. That's another 45 days. If you add that up, that's an extra 75 days. Now you're going, okay, I wasn't a math student, neither was I, but let me show you how it breaks down. Very simple. All right, initially he said 1,260 days. That's three and a half years. That's when the second half of the tribulation happens. The Antichrist right here uh, stops sacrifices, sets up an image, demands that the world worship him. If you don't take the mark during this last three and a half years, you cannot buy or sell. You will starve unless God provides for you. That's 1,260 days. But then he mentions 1,290 days. That's an extra 30 days. And then to the 1,290, he adds 45 more days. That makes it 1,335 days. So if you take the extra 30 right here, and the extra 45, that's an extra 75 days added on to this 1260. So the question is, if the 1260 is three and a half years, why is God adding on an extra 75 days? We don't know, but here's what many people think are going to happen. It's during the extra 75 days that you have Matthew 25 played out where Jesus is going to separate the sheep from the goats. How you treated Israel during the tribulation. The sheep will enter into the millennial kingdom. The goats will be cast into the lake of fire. And many people believe there's going to have to be a time of cleanup to some degree. And it's preparation for entering into the millennial kingdom. So the fact is, we really don't know this extra 75 days attached to the 1260, three and a half years. We really don't know specifically why the extra 75 days. But it's preparation at the end here to enter into the thousand-year millennial kingdom. At the end of the thousand years, you have the eternal state. Well, there's one final point here that we want to look at as we close this evening, and that is this. There will be a great separation during the tribulation period, a great separation. Notice, if you will, verse 10. Many will be purged, cleansed, and refined. During that time period, many Gentiles will be purged, cleansed, and refined, but many Jews are going to be purged, cleansed, and refined. But notice the separation. The wicked will act wickedly. They're going to get worse. They're going to wring their hands at God during the tribulation, and they're going to curse God, it says in the book of Revelation. And none of the wicked will understand, ah, you Christians, you're a bunch of idiots. This is just natural phenomena. This isn't God's hand. Of course, the Greek word here is the word the view. <laughs> None of the wicked will understand. But those who have insight will understand. You know what separates the believer from the non-believer? We have the Holy Spirit. We have the insight of God. We understand what's going on. We look it through the lens prophetically. They look at it through the lens of what? Just history. History to a lot of people is just cyclical. You live, you die, you fix cars in between. That's their mentality. Chapter 11, verse 35, he says this, and some of those who have insight will fall to refine, purge, and cleanse them until the end of time because it is still to come at the appointed time. In other words, during the seven-year tribulation, you know what God's going to do? He's going to separate the true believer from the false believer. He's going to separate the believer from the unbeliever. He's going to separate truth from error. And born-again Christians during that time who lived during the tribulation, they, did, they weren't raptured out, but they got saved during the tribulation, they're going to have insight into what's going on. But the non-believers, they're not, and they're going to become more indignant. God's going to separate. He's going to purify. He's going to refine. Now, Ezekiel and Zechariah, real quickly as we close, tell us, tells us the percentages of how God will separate and refine. Here are the percentages. Get ready. Ezekiel 20. 
Here is what God says he's going to do during the tribulation. I will bring you, speaking of Israel, from the nations and gather you from the countries where you have been scattered with a mighty hand and outstretched arm and with outpoured wrath. I will bring you into the wilderness of the nations and there, face to face, I will execute judgment on you. He says this to Israel. As I judge your ancestors in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will judge you, declares the sovereign Lord. And notice what he says in verse 37. I will take note of you as you pass under my rod. Sheep would often pass under the rod of the shepherd. He would inspect the sheep when they would pass under the rod. God says, I'm going to do that to you, Israel, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant, and look what he says in verse 38. Here's the separation. I will purge you of those who revolt and rebel against me. You know what God's going to do in the last half of the three and a half years of the tribulation? He is going to purge Israel, and he's going to purge out the rebels. The rebels of Israel that don't embrace Jesus as their Messiah, he's going to purge them out. Although I will bring them out of the land where they are living, yet they will not enter the land of Israel, then you will know that I am the Lord. You say, well, how many is he going to purge out? Well, Zechariah tells us. Here it is. Of the Jews, I will bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them, and I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. And so based on Ezekiel and Zechariah, here is what God's going to do to separate the Jew, the true Jew, from the false Jew. One-third will be purified. Two-thirds of the rebels will be purged. To say it another way, two out of every three Jews will be purged. And they will constitute the Romans 11, all Israel will be saved. When he says all Israel will be saved, Paul, in Romans 11, he's not saying every Jew will be saved. Two-thirds of them will be purged. Only one-third will be separated and refined, and they will look on Jesus as their Messiah. And by the way, isn't that what persecution does? Doesn't persecution separate the true from the false? I guarantee you if persecution broke out in America, more than half of the church would basically scurry like cockroaches coming out from under the rock. When you lift up the rock and the light hits the cockroach, it scurries. That's what happens to a lot of would-be Christians in the American church. They would bolt because really they're not saved or they're in it for superficial reasons. And so what have we learned tonight about the tribulation as we end the book of Daniel? First of all, we have learned there will be a great suffering. Secondly, there will be a great deliverance, physically and spiritually, among the Jews. Thirdly, there's going to be a great resurrection. Fourthly, there's going to be great rewards that are going to be dispensed. Fifthly, there is going to be a greater pursuit of knowledge and understanding of prophecy during the end of time. Six, there will be a specific timetable. And then finally, there will be a great separation. So the question is this, what are you doing with your faith?